Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to. Cat is like. Today we're going to greet you in some of the languages from the rest of Africa. Oh, what have I done? Please enjoy. I've done something. Oh, sweet. Jumbo. Kikati. Moro. Hi there everybody and welcome to the second spotlight session of the World Congress in Music Therapy in South Africa, virtually speaking, this year. Um, the topic, as you would well know, is advancing music therapy research, which is a very exciting topic for me to be moderating on your behalf as I'm currently the Commissioner for Research and Ethics with the World Federation of Music Therapy as well as ongoingly being a professor of music therapy at the University of Melbourne in Australia. It's wonderful to be able to spend time hearing from five esteemed researchers from literally around the globe today. We have three female speakers from the Australasia region, which is um, including Malaysia, South Korea, and Australia. And it's important to note this emphasis on an emerging practices. We also have two male speakers from the more traditional countries of the origins of music therapy in the UK and in America. But it's interesting to note what's important to these researchers who bring diverse influences from around the globe. Music therapy research has taken uh, many approaches very seriously, as we've seen through all of our refereed journal publications and textbooks on this topic. It's an umbrella of practices. There isn't one way of doing music therapy research. In fact, I would say that there's not even a dominant way of doing music therapy research. It's exciting to note that in the presentations, we have so much uh, variety from ethnographically informed research taken, which has taken place over a long period of time, which is what Gary Ansdor will be talking to us about, um, as well as some reasonably long-term research also from Gina Kim from South Korea, who's going to be going into a, a more in-depth look using a case study from her research in the field of autism. And it's these kinds of rich, deep, dives into understanding what we do, which is becoming more and more common in music therapy research. And this complements more practical, um, pragmatic approaches to research, which endorse an evidence-based approach. And that's what Felicity Baker from Australia, my colleague, will be describing and her international trials in the fields of, in the field of dementia specifically. And then Indra Salvaraj from Malaysia also talking to us about how important it is to maintain cultural sensitivity and contextually relevant research so that we don't have this sense of um, research which is being done in one place uh, somewhere in the world is necessarily the right form 
for another place which has a whole array of different systemic and uh, cultural and contextual influences. And so it's really important that all of the researchers in this section, in this spotlight session, are really committed to non-dominant approaches and into sharing what they think is important in their place and then allowing us as the readers and consumers of research to make our decisions about which bits we'll use from which places. And uh, the final presenter, not necessarily in order, being um, Mike Viega's arts-based research, which is of course an emerging and popular form of research within music therapy, quite naturally, because the ways that we approach research as music therapists do tend to either reflect uh, the ways that we practice, where musicking helps us understand more about what's happening than any words that people might use to describe the practice, and hence arts-based research is really important. But so is ethnographic research with a long-term focus, and so is quantitative data that helps us meet the establishment's need for proof and evidence, and so is the importance of really thinking about what do we need right now as music therapists, which is what happens um, in all of the research being presented today. So I'm really thrilled to uh, be sharing in the experience of hearing all of these expert opinions and I welcome you to this session and hope that you find it incredibly stimulating as I know that you will. Thank you. My name is Indra Selvaraja, and I come from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I'd like to thank the World Congress of Music Therapy for giving me this opportunity to share what we are doing in Malaysia to advance research in music therapy. This presentation is divided into four sections. It begins with a brief glimpse at our research team and a short explanation of what University Putra Malaysia or UPM for short, has done to advance music therapy-based research in Malaysia. It focuses on the challenges and opportunities inherent in an emerging music therapy research environment and articulates the team's efforts to develop a locally contextualized evidence base that can help to inform and support the ongoing music therapy work. It ends with a brief exploration of where we are going from here and what future development plans are in store to further advance music therapy research in Malaysia. To provide you with some background, I work for a government university, University Putra Malaysia, which is one of five research universities in Malaysia. I'm based at the UPM Department of Music, Faculty of Human Ecology, and perform a variety of academic duties, not all of which involves music therapy. At present, Around 50% of my work in UPM involves music therapy. On that note, please allow me to briefly introduce to you our UPM research team. On my right is Dr. Ang Mi Fong, a well-established and famous soprano in Malaysia, who studied under the distinguished soprano Malin Quaif at the University of Melbourne at some point. She was my first PhD student her PhD research combined Western classical singing with medical music therapy to provide a voice rehabilitation protocol for people with Parkinson's. Dr. Ang is now a well-esteemed colleague, and we have since gone on to create Hand in Hand, an inclusive performance and research platform to advocate for people with special needs and champion for more inclusion in Malaysia. The gentleman on the left is Associate Professor Dr. Chan Cheong Jan, a senior colleague in the Department of Music. We co-teach a music and special education course which I created for UPM in 2018. And we are both co-researchers in the Fusion Lab under the Faculty of Education, which runs special needs education research, clinical and outreach programs in collaboration with Japan. Our latest research measured audiences' perceptions towards inclusion. Data was captured following a music therapy inclusion workshop for special needs children 
on February 27, 2020, in collaboration with the Kita Kyushu Marimba Orchestra of Japan, just before Malaysia went into pandemic lockdown. The lady on the left is Dr. Julia Cheng, who is another former research student of mine at the UPM Department of Music. Julia completed her PhD in soundscape research in 2019 at the University of Sheffield and joined our department as a lecturer. To date, Julia and I have conducted two music therapy-based research projects together. The first study in 2018 was commissioned by the Sarawak Tourism Board and State Government and centered around exploring the therapeutic potential of the Rainforest World Music Festival, which is held annually in East Malaysia. The second, completed this year, was an exploratory study on the impact of a sensory-friendly concert environment on special needs children. We collected the data just before the lockdown and are currently analysing the data in preparation for a joint conference presentation. In lay the groundwork for music therapy research, UPM has produced more than 20 community research and development initiatives from 2015 to the present. The work has been made possible through collaborations with government agencies, private organisations and various grassroots non-government organisations in Malaysia. Areas of research have primarily centred around off-neglected and underserved populations, such as people with Parkinson's disease, people with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, stroke and traumatic brain injury patients in hospital rehabilitation settings, children and young adults on the autism spectrum, children with dyslexia and Down syndrome, as well as the well elderly. What is highlighted on this slide are some of the milestones which reflect our past five years trajectory. The formation of these five research clusters began with projects that centered around music and special needs. The first focus group study was conducted at the Music Therapy and Autism Seminar in 2015 the first music therapy seminar in Malaysia. This seminar was a platform for UPM to help support and introduce our music therapists in Malaysia to the community and give them an opportunity to share their respective work with autistic individuals. During that seminar, the music therapist and I obtained feedback from participants who had consented to being involved in focus group research. Participants consisted of various stakeholders who were involved in our local special needs scene. They consisted of parents of special needs children, special ed teachers, allied health therapists, NGOs, special ed centres, music teachers, university educators and university students. From the data, I learned that many of them had no music background and had no idea what music therapy was about but they had come to the seminar to learn how music therapy could benefit autistic children. Following the completion of the study, the findings from the focus group reports were given to the Malaysian Music Therapy Association to support the work of our Malaysian music therapists who predominantly work with special needs children. Shifting to the second cluster, this cluster comprised of three research projects catering to people with Parkinson's. In 2016, I was asked by the Malaysian Society of Music and Medicine if I could conduct an interactive session for World Parkinson's Day and share about the benefits of music therapy for people with Parkinson's. I conducted a group interactive session at the event and the president, Ms. Sarah Liu, invited me over to the Malaysian Parkinson's Disease Association to conduct music therapy activities for them. That started the ball rolling for a series of preliminary music therapy explorations which led to the three research projects at the NPDA and helped to produce Dr. Ang Mei Fong's PhD. I will pause my sharing about the other four research clusters at this point in the interest of time. I will be going more deeply into our Music Hills cluster later on in this presentation. However, if you have any questions regarding the remaining three clusters, please feel free to ask during the Q&A. Thank you. Challenges and opportunities. No precedents. When we started, there was literally no precedents for music therapy research in Malaysia. There were already music therapists who were working hard and doing wonderful work, 
but there was very low awareness of music therapy research in Malaysia. That was our first major challenge, needing to develop cultural sensitivity. As Malaysia is a melting pot of three main ethnicities, Malay, Chinese and Indian, we have to cater to music and language preferences as music therapists. However, we don't have a systematic database of Malaysian music organized for music therapy, which means a lot of trial and error when selecting and using music for clients. Yet we know that appropriate song selection is a very important factor to build therapeutic connection. Hence, one of the research studies which we conducted in UPM in 2017 was a music preference study with older Chinese adults. This was done to help us yield a basic repertoire of songs which we could use for outreach work with older Chinese adults, whom we found ourselves frequently catering to. Validating Western-based music therapy techniques for our local context while preserving research integrity and ensuring treatment fidelity. This has been a major area of translation as all of the music therapy training which our Malaysian music therapists have received is from overseas and mainly based on US, UK or Australian contexts. Validation of specific music therapy techniques with appropriate populations has therefore been a painstaking but necessary and important part of our research work in UPM. Misuse of the term music therapy this is a very real ongoing problem in Malaysia. I know this is not a problem that is unique to us, but I will share our experience of how we've dealt with this through research awareness and educational advocacy in a subsequent slide entitled, Turning Challenges into Opportunities. Battling Mindsets. There is a pre-existing fear among some Muslims in Malaysia that music can cause people to lose themselves and indulge in immoral behavior. Although I've had long conversations about this with Muslim scholars who work in music education at other universities, and they have strongly refuted the notion. Nonetheless, the belief still persists, and this is one of the areas that we music therapists have to be prepared for and sensitive in dealing with in research, as it represents our current reality, and Muslims account for 68% of our Malaysian population. Lack of willingness to share data, which makes collecting research data more challenging. This issue is complex as there are valid privacy and confidentiality issues of clients that we must always safeguard and respect. However, the challenge also stems from a fear of losing out and allowing others to have an advantage over you if you share too much information. I have been informed by Ministry of Health officials that this lack of willingness also stems from a fear of incorrect practices being made known and penalties being levied. Which leads to my next point, lack of trust due to unfamiliarity with music therapy. I have found throughout the time that we've attempted to conduct research that building trust and rapport is so important. However, this is a double-edged sword. Minimizing bias in research. We also have to ensure that trust does not result in acquiescence bias or social desirability bias. This is the challenge that I try to prepare the UPM research team for when conducting research fieldwork and collecting data. Lack of manpower. At the moment, I'm very lonely and we need more trained PhD music therapy researchers to bolster ongoing research efforts. The next set of challenges revolves around the fact that music therapy is a new field within the university system. There's no existing paradigm that completely fits the field of music therapy within the existing academic structure, and expectations of university key performance indices are not aligned to music therapy standards in Malaysia. And when I've tried applying for research grants, there is no clear category that music therapy fits into. In line with these challenges, trying to build up a strong track record for music therapy has been imperative in order to justify to university management the need to establish and support the growth of music therapy where there has been no precedence in Malaysia. However, one advantage has been because of our research university status. It is easier to justify the need to conduct more research. The criteria and standards for training students to produce research are very high and the requirements for approving and conducting research, including the ethical clearance process, are very stringent and comprehensive. This has actually been a bonus to help us achieve more research rigour. Policy changes. Malaysia's national cultural policy has positioned music and the performing arts sector under tourism and culture. The official view confines the role of music to entertainment and the promotion of traditional culture. 
This view is severely limiting, as it means that there is little appreciation for music beyond its commercial value and the role of music in promoting traditional culture as a tourist attraction. To give you an idea, I've been asked as recently as this February if I thought medical music therapy could be harnessed to promote medical tourism. Music education has suffered greatly as a result and has had a very hard time growing in Malaysia, despite valiant efforts by music educators to spread the benefits of music education to government schools. Until today, music education in government schools has experienced more dismantling than growth. Music education in the private sector, on the other hand, is thriving, but it is expensive and not accessible and affordable to Malaysians from poor socioeconomic backgrounds. Poor command of English among students. All our documents and lesson plans have to be translated into our national language, which is Bahasa Malaysia. However, there is a lack of terminology in Bahasa Malaysia for music therapy. Hence, I have to do a lot of translation work and work on explaining music therapy in ways that students who are primarily Malay or even Chinese speaking can understand. A high proportion of students who study in our department are Chinese educated and have a really tough time reading research articles on music therapy. That connects us to the next challenge, low critical thinking skills. As students can't understand what they read, it is very difficult for them to conceptualize, let alone draw critical conclusions when preparing their literature review. As a result, I have to spend a lot of extra time guiding students to make sure they understand what they are reading and synthesizing for purposes of conducting research. The rest of the challenges are rather self-explanatory. I do not want to belabor those points. Turning challenges into opportunities by increasing research advocacy, educational awareness and community engagement. To tackle this particular set of challenges, we organize educational awareness and community engagement opportunities. One of the things I did upon returning from the US was to get to know the local music therapists and understand their needs. I tried to rally them together using UPM's platform as a support, as we needed a collective voice to create a stronger momentum for music therapy. The first advocacy event was the Music Therapy Autism Seminar, which was previously mentioned. I have an arts management background from my earlier music training in the UK, and one of the courses that I teach in UPM is music management. The course requires me to teach music students who enter our Bachelor of Music program how to organize music concerts, recitals, festivals, and so forth. But it became a convenient platform to gather our Malaysian music therapists and organize our very first music therapy seminar. As mentioned just now, that is where I coincided it with research by collecting focus group data. I went on to helm a second conference, Music Cares, Music as a Catalyst for Nation Building and Community Growth in 2016, which also saw the launching of the Malaysian Music Therapy Association. Music Cares was an extension from the 2015 seminar. Through the combined support of two universities, UPM and HELP University, a private university, we were able to bring Dr. Barbara Villa, Dr. Kat McFerrin and Dr. Laurie Gooding into Malaysia as our three keynote speakers to talk about music therapy and share the findings from music therapy research. Their contributions were significant and we ended up with participants from more than 10 countries attending the conference. Incidentally, at this conference, we also collected additional focus group data, which would enable the MMTA to better understand participants' responses to music therapy and identify their immediate needs. Music Heals in 2019, which brought in even more research advocacy gave UPM the chance to present the results of many research studies which we had been working on the last three years. One of the ways to tackle the abuse of the term music therapy is through educational engagement, where we create opportunities for folks to learn more about what music therapy is and isn't. And I've been fortunate to have music therapy drumming experts like Kalani Das, who offered his support at a time when I was at the forefront of dealing with such challenges. And the problem was somehow made known to him. Long story short, we created Healing Rhythms of the Rainforest, a two-day music therapy drumming workshop last year in UPM to address this problem. Among other activities, we shared research findings on the differences between drum circles and music therapy drumming and invited members of the drum circle community to engage with us. Our UPM team then conducted research on the perceptions of participants following the event to measure changes in attitudes. With regards to 
Chiras Rehabilitation Hospital, I am truly thankful to the medical specialists whom I've worked with at CRH, who have been standing up for the music therapy work we are doing and lending support in ways that have gone all the way up to the Malaysian Ministry of Health. As a result, the medical community and the allied health unit of the ministry has reached out and given their endorsement to UPM to move forward and advance music therapy in the country and given us the green light to develop a music therapy training program at tertiary level. These are all efforts that spill over to helping to advance research in music therapy. But there are still many bureaucratic barriers within the university to overcome for music therapy to grow further. Another solution to some of the challenges I mentioned was to create a structured process for current students interested in going into music therapy to work towards that career pathway. Research training is an essential part of career development in UPM for students interested in embarking on music therapy. It involves a three-step process, as you can see, which culminates in a final year project. Additional criteria include a music therapy related internship requirement, research training, and active participation in music therapy outreach activities which they must attend additional training for. Since 2016, approximately 25% of students entering the UPM Department of Music have chosen to embark on a music therapy career pathway. We introduced the inclusion of an ethical requirement into all student research from 2018, which has been a really important development. Another solution was to evolve our engagement approach from a purely music therapy-based focus to a broader music health and well-being perspective. In 2018, I was approached by the Malaysian Society for Music and Medicine to help them organize a conference. I conceptualized Music Heals as a research-driven conference focused on exploring a broader scope of music in the context of healing, how it affects our human body and interacts with our environment to trigger therapeutic benefits from both traditional and contemporary medical perspectives. It also examines how thoughtful and appropriate ways of delivering music can become a positive and proactive catalyst in the therapeutic process, both in music therapy and music medicine. As music therapy is still considered a very niche area in Malaysia, which is often misunderstood, approaching it from the broader, more relatable music and well-being context allowed us to peel back the layers and zoom in on the differences between music therapy music and medicine and music as medicine, and to introduce more clarity into the discourse. That difference was vividly demonstrated via two outstanding keynotes by Assistant Professor Dr. Laurie Gooding, the current president of the American Music Therapy Association, who defined terminologies, drew boundaries, and delineated the differences between music therapy and music and medicine. We found this approach to be effective in engaging audiences, many of whom consisted of stakeholders who worked in various healthcare settings interested in music therapy. This slide presents the range of research-based presentations which were featured during Music Heals. They represent studies that have been conducted over the years in UPM, mostly at postgraduate level. Three of the studies were conducted by my PhD research students. One of the studies presented was by Professor Manoha Arumugam a senior professor from the UPM Faculty of Medicine. His study focused on hand disorders and muscular tendinous anomalies among musicians in Malaysia. His research sample was derived from orchestra players around Kuala Lumpur who had sought help from a government hospital neighbouring UPM. The problem was so frequent that Prof Manoha, who happens to be a violinist, decided to conduct a research study and presented the findings during the conference. This slide provides a glimpse of the demographic data and one of the main outcomes of Music Heals, which was the enlistment of more organisations interested to move forward in conducting research with us. As you can see, more than a quarter of conference attendees were from the healthcare sector, which included heads of medical programmes from hospitals, directors of research institutes, as well as allied health workers from both government and private organisations. In response, I've since initiated the setting up of a task force to coordinate the forward movement of all music heals activities. It will be a formal mechanism to approach and conduct related activities in order to initiate more systematic and organized research and apply for research grants. Roadmap forward.
At the end of 2019, I was approached by the head of the rehabilitation unit at the UPM Teaching Hospital, or Hospital Bengaja UPM in Bahasa Malaysia, who requested the setting up of a medical music therapy program at the newly built hospital. They have since provided a music therapy lab and requested various quotations to provide necessary equipment and instruments. This will complement the ongoing work at Chiras Rehabilitation Hospital, which was started in 2017. This initiative by the UPM Teaching Hospital coincides with requests from the Malaysian Ministry of Health for hospital program development. My dilemma now is to decide whether music therapy should remain in my current faculty, the UPM Faculty of Human Ecology, or should be moved to the UPM Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences to ensure better alignment and smoother operations for the next phase of music therapy development work, including research. There are five areas of research development that UPM plans to embark on for the next phase. Like everyone else, the COVID pandemic has thrown a major curveball to our plans. We are still struggling and trying our best to evolve and establish the new norm. But the elements represented in this diagram are stable and signify the next phase of our development work. The most exciting catalyst for 2021 will be the arrival of Assistant Professor Dr. Laurie Gooding of Florida State University, who has been granted a Fulbright Award to conduct a large-scale needs assessment study with UPM to lend support to developing a local research repository and help develop the music therapy training program in Malaysia. On a personal note, I'm indebted to Professor Jane Stanley, the director of FSU Music Therapy, and the entire music therapy team at the FSU College of Music for being so incredibly supportive and for allowing Dr. Laurie Gooding to take leave from FSU for an extended period of time to come help us build up the music therapy work here in Malaysia for the benefit of the region. We are also most grateful to the US government and Fulbright Commission for the Fulbright Award, which will enable Dr. Gooding to reside in Malaysia for several months and work closely with our UPM music therapy team. In UPM, we are passionate about doing research that contributes towards social change. As a researcher come accidental community activist, I've been privileged to work with off-neglected and marginalized groups, including people with Parkinson's disease. My primary aim has been to use research as a tool to shed light on their current situation, to listen and to give them a voice, to better understand their needs, to promote preservation of personhood and to bridge the gap between them and society, so that through a better understanding and increased empathy, their needs can ultimately be met. It sometimes involves participatory action research, such as this example on the right, highlighted in blue, that employed song lyric analysis and songwriting to create a safe space for people with Parkinson's to surface their experiences and reveal their innermost struggles. This song, Together We Conquer Parkinson's, is a direct outcome of a Parkinson's research study to assess the current status of mental health and coping, which was conducted in 2018. This originally composed song has since been adopted as the official theme song of the Malaysian Parkinson's Disease Association and is frequently performed by the association Songbirds Parkinson's Awareness Choir, another offshoot of another research study by UPM, to advocate for and help educate the community about Parkinson's disease. This slide is a visual tour of other UPM research-based community transformation projects, some of which are still ongoing. At the end of the day, this is what we sincerely hope to achieve through all our research efforts. Community transformation through music therapy, not just for Malaysia, but to serve everyone in our beloved global family. Thank you.
So thank you to the World Federation of Music Therapy for inviting me to be a spotlight speaker this year. It's such an honour. But I guess this isn't exactly the way I thought I'd be delivering my speech. But here we are, life is full of surprises. So I know that when most people present at a conference, they report on their research findings or share clinical examples of their work. But I wanted to do something a little bit different today. I want to talk about my experiences of setting up, engaging in and managing large scale clinical trials. I'm going to report on some of the challenges I've encountered. And I certainly want to touch on some of the triumphs that I've experienced during my research journey. And I'm going to do this by describing my involvement in two separate studies that I'm currently leading. So I want to start by first introducing the National Health and Medical Research Council grant funded project, the Medell study, which is an international multi-site study looking at the effects of music interventions on depression and neuropsychiatric symptoms of people living with dementia and residing in aged care homes. The full international trial is being led by my dear colleague, Professor Christian Gold from Norway. However, Australia was the first country to receive funding in 2017, and the other five countries are yet to commence the trial, although they all now have funding to do so. As we have been working away at this trial for two and a half years already, we have really been pioneering the study on behalf of the whole international team. And we're proud to say that as of March this year, before COVID-19, we had recruited 397 participants. Just briefly, the trial tests the effectiveness of group music therapy, recreational choir singing, or both, and compares their impact with standard care over six months. In addition to examining the effects on depression and behavioural symptoms of dementia, the trial tracks changes in medication use, the quality of life of residents, it measures the burden experienced by staff, and captures the cost effectiveness and cost benefits of delivering the interventions in the home care setting. In the trial, the group music therapy aims to provide person-centered care with a focus on biography and regulating arousal. It includes singing, listening, improvisation, dancing and movement, reminiscence and verbal reflection. And the intervention is delivered by a qualified music therapist. Recreational group singing, however, is conducted within a non-therapeutic context. It focuses on singing only and is delivered by a person other than a trained music therapist. For example, a community musician or a musically skilled nurse. In the study, homes or what we call sites were cluster randomized into one of those four conditions. We made a strategic decision to select homes where there was no music therapy currently being delivered as we wanted to use this trial as an opportunity to advocate for music therapy services. And rather than selecting individual homes, we selected four large home care providers that between them housed 25,000 residents in Australia. We met with the CEO or medical director of each organisation who had responsibility for managing multiple homes within their organisations. This decision stemmed from our assumption that if we had buy-in from the top of the organisation, then there was a greater chance the commitment and buy-in would filter down to the care home level as well. This strategy certainly proved to be a good one, as when there were issues, we were able to communicate with those at the management level. That said, we have been fortunate to have sustained great relationships with all our care homes to date. And these relationships were critical and helped us ensure retirement recruitment was efficient. Staff are proactive in arranging opportunities for us to present information at family meetings, and the staff talked up the value and importance of the study with families and residents in their day-to-day -day interactions with them. At each site, 
Care home managers had a designated site coordinator who was our go-to person, ensuring smooth delivery and implementation of our project. Despite these incredible efforts by the homes, this project was definitely not a walk in the park. In fact, the sheer number of obstacles blocking our journey far surpassed our expectations. So let's just have a brief look at a couple of these. Well, firstly, as one would expect, perhaps the biggest impact on our study has been COVID-19. At the time of its impact, we had been running music therapy interventions for approximately 15 months. We had provided 894 music intervention sessions across 20 care homes. The COVID-19 lockdown meant that we could not finish the music interventions in cycle five that we'd started. So residents would not attend the minimum number of sessions needed to say they had received enough of the intervention to remain included in our study. That means 66 participants will drop out because of COVID-19. We will not be able to complete data collection for cycle three and potentially cycle four either. And cycle six was just about to commence and it is unlikely to go ahead now as the project was due to wind up in May 2022. But as we soon discovered, lockdowns were quite common, something we did not really anticipate when developing our clinical trial design. Gastro and influenza outbreaks are represented in this diagram by these symbols. And in some lock homes, lockdowns occurred multiple times, sometimes for more than three weeks at a stretch. These lockdowns greatly affected how many intervention sessions were provided, and as mentioned before, whether the minimum number of sessions were provided. Lockdowns also occurred during times when we were supposed to carry out our assessments. The impact here was that the assessment periods were out of sync with their planned period and caused violation of the study protocol. Another factor we didn't prepare for was the amount of wait time our assessors had when trying to collect data for residents and care home staff. Owing to the workload of care staff, our research team were expected to wait extraordinarily long periods for care staff to be available to commit the psychometric tests. This resulted in a large number of days between the first person being assessed at any one home and the last person. To reduce these wait times and expedite the assessment process, we decided to invest and buy additional staff members to assist the homes to complete their work on the days that we were there to collect data. And you will see here that the yellow bars are the waiting times our team had at each site. The ones circled in red were those where we paid for additional staff to be on site while we completed the assessments. And you can just see how much the waiting time was reduced compared when we employed additional personal care staff uh, during the, when we didn't employ care staff during the first two cycles. And this all resulted in a reduced number of days spent assessing at each site. We wish we'd thought of this strategy much earlier. So now let's go on to the next project. And this is Homeside. It focuses on indirect models of music therapy, where we train family carers of people living with dementia at home to use music in strategic and targeted ways to support wellbeing. The Homeside program aims to assist carers to manage their loved one's symptoms and thereby keep them living at home with their families for as long as possible. It aims to enhance the carer's wellbeing to provide them with opportunities for meaningful engagement and to reduce the economic impact of an increasing ageing population. Homeside uses a purposefully developed music therapy informed intervention to coach family carers to use music in a more purposeful way. It incorporates Kitwood's model of personhood and person-centred dementia care and emphasises communication and relationships, 
It also recognises that dementia is best understood as an interplay between neurological, psychosocial and environmental factors. So the idea of this study started way back in 2006 when I secured some money to develop and pilot a home-based program for couples where one spouse was living with dementia. After publishing the pilot, I tried three times to secure funding for a fully fledged trial, but with no success. So I shelved the project for a few years to pursue some other research interests until another opportunity to fund this research showed itself to me. So in 2018, together with wonderful colleagues from Norway, the UK, Germany and Poland, we secured funding for an international trial. And in the wonderful words of the late Professor Tony Wigram, we thought it was such a triumph. There are three arms to this study, a music intervention, a reading intervention and standard care. Carers receive a two hour training session with two follow up sessions, three and six weeks after the initial session. And the sessions show them how to use music or reading in targeted ways to manage symptoms and support the maintenance of meaningful relationships. Carers are then asked to use the music and reading activities with the person with dementia five times a week for 12 weeks. As you can probably imagine, with a trial conducted in five countries and with a target sample of 495 carers and 495 people with dementia, this is a mammoth undertaking starting with managing five incredibly large and dynamic teams. First, we have the Australian team. Then we have the Polish team and the UK team. And then the German team and the Norwegian team, all just beautiful people. But home side, was a very different beast to Modell and required a lot more planning, something that ended up taking us almost a year from woe to go. Some tasks took much longer than we had anticipated. For example, we needed a signed consortium agreement among the five universities. We couldn't actually access any money before we'd done that. The agreement covered all sorts of issues, including IP, data management and liability. And the legal teams engaged us in a backwards and forwards process until we finally got agreement amongst the five countries. Consequently, some countries' monies were more delayed in reaching them than others, and this resulted in a staggered start for the project. The UK, Australian and German teams had their money in April, whereas the Norwegians waited until September and the Polish team not until December. So this makes managing our timelines for the project quite challenging. So after the consortium agreement, we then had to register the trial, develop the trial database and apply for ethics. Again, country differences in regulations led to a lot of toing and froing. And with the EU's new general data protection regulation or otherwise known as the GDPR coming into effect in May this year, the stricter data protection laws in some countries meant we had to sign additional legal contracts regarding data privacy. Our REDCap database had to be built from scratch and was designed to capture all data right from any inquiry from a potential participant through to participant screening, recording of adverse events, home visit safety checks, delivery of interventions and data from all the psychometric measures that we used. Indeed, building and testing the database, which had about 1,400 items, took about nine months. And even after it went live, we still discovered some missing items and also made some more tweaks along the way. The sheer number of discussions just around, for example, how to record age was challenging. Some countries could only put in an age range, like from 60 to 65 and 66 to 70 where others could only put in year of birth, others could put in, a, in the actual uh, date of birth. So it, it went on a bit till we found a solution that um, met everybody's data protection regulations. 
lots to think of things to think about, but an incredibly sophisticated database that enabled us to track everything from our first to our last encounter with every participant. Next, we had to recruit and train our research staff. Everyone in the team had a specific role and had to be trained to perform that role. We created 43 training videos, which we loaded up on YouTube to accompany our 177 page handbook of procedures. All staff were required to review the videos and they were then tested on their understanding of the content for every module. So the purpose behind this process was to ensure training was standardised and all had a shared and common understanding of the interventions, data collection processes and overall delivery of the trial. Communication with five teams, 70 staff across five countries and multiple time zones meant communication was sometimes a challenge for us. As its leader, it was important for me to facilitate a consultative process so all countries feel their views are heard and everyone is comfortable with the decisions made. We have worked hard to create a team culture of respecting difference and there were and continue to be many of these. Meeting physically twice a year helps the team to connect and strengthen their shared vision while also working intensively on such projects and making critical decisions about the trials procedures. We also use email, of course, and we also meet fortnightly online to work on issues and monitor the project. The highly complex nature of the trial creates additional challenges. As a leader, I'm expected to be across the evolution of the trial and monitor its progress at the international level rather than purely at a local level. It's often difficult for me to hold all this in my head while also splitting my time between other university duties. My team is very patient with me when I forget some of these small details. They're quite kind to me when they remind me. We all know that burden on participants can lead to attrition or to low participant uptake. And we've been conscious all the time to try to and balance the need to collect rich and detailed data with the need to minimise participant burden. We really tried to get this balance right. We haven't yet had any dropouts due to burden, but it's fair to say, I think, that some of the potential participants may not have taken up opportunities to participate because they were not confident they could manage to commit with, uh, to the time that was required of them. And then there's the cost of delivering a trial, which is enormous. Consider just the impact of COVID-19 on the Medell study. 83 participants had been screened and recruited, ready to begin, but the homes went into lockdown before that was possible. Another 65 participants had received less than half the planned intervention, so it won't meet our minimum adherence, even if COVID-19 resolves quickly. This is at an enormous cost for data we can no longer use. Delays caused by the long period taken to develop the Homeside database also uses our budget, which was supposed to be allocated to the implementation of the study. This delay affected the starting date for our recruitment in three of the countries. Staff recruitment and training also costs money. So the delay in commencing recruitment led some of our fully trained staff to find other work thereby requiring us to recruit and train new staff, something we didn't anticipate or budget for. More learning for us. We have found that each country and each partner is different. We've had to learn how to work together. We've focused on establishing a consensus about each other's roles and responsibilities so that lines of communication and decision-making are clear and the potential for conflict is minimised. Miscommunication has occurred from time to time, often due to language differences. But we are acknowledging this and have now created a communication culture that is honest but also respectful. Another learning for us has been how to assist our interventionists to transition from a clinician to a research clinician. 
following an intervention protocol strictly with fidelity rather than being more spontaneous and shifting to a therapeutic process that isn't part of the study intervention has certainly been challenging for some of our clinicians. Our supervision at both country and international levels are being utilised to monitor this. And now just to finish with a couple more highlights. Well, I have to say that working with a terrific team has been nothing short of just sensational. There's a clear group spirit among us and we are working towards a common goal. And the team's diversity in perspectives, alongside their absolute commitment and collaborative presence, makes leading these trials such a joy. We are learning from one another and pooling our resources to deliver clinical trials on a scale unimaginable without our combined effort. And of course, much learning and pleasure is derived from our engagement with our consumer advisory committees and not forgetting those who are most important of all, our participants, who continue to be a source of learning and inspiration for all of us. So in closing, I hope that while I haven't shared any research results as such, that I've taken you on a little bit of a journey about what my experiences are in leading and managing large scale randomised control trials. They are challenging and I've laid awake many nights wondering how on earth am I going to solve this problem. The trials and tribulations are indeed significant and unfortunately relatively common. <laughs> but the rewards, the triumphs, these far outweigh these challenges and are what get me out of bed every day. No doubt I'm going to do this again and again and again until I retire. Thank you. In my 23 minutes today, I want to shine a gentle spotlight on the issue of ecological validity in music therapy research. Um, asking what is this and is it important for us today? And actually the spotlight metaphor is a good place to start because light of course has been a metaphor for knowledge and truth since the birth of modern science in the Enlightenment period. Research is often seen as shining a spotlight at something in order to get a clear focused result, or at least that's the theory. And the strength of research is traditionally based on validity relating to clarity, to focus and to control. In the classic methods you'll find usually two types of validity mentioned. Firstly, there's internal validity, which in experimental research means having sufficient control of your variables such that you can competently say that correlation equals causation. And then secondly, there's external validity, which concerns the generalizability of research or the degree that we can trust that the lessons that we learn from experiments in the laboratory will actually translate to real world practice. Um, and the textbook that I was looking at recently also went on to say, and I quote here, if internal validity is the crown jewel of experimentation, external validity is its Achilles heel. That is, there's a built-in weakness within the system of experimental trials. And the potential downfall in research is simply that there's often a mismatch between the lab and the real world. And that what the research says happens under experimental conditions doesn't happen in the outside, in the real world. Concern with this situation has led to a third criterion being added to this classic pair, and this is ecological validity. This asks not just whether the lab results are generalizable, but whether they actually shine the light on the right thing in the first place. That is, 
does the research inquiry match the logic of the natural ecology of practice? Or does it instead substitute some artificial, oversimplified proxy model of what something like music therapy practice really is? The risk is that formal research often begins with the wrong questions. It predecides that, for example, music therapy must work as a treatment to directly change symptoms or behavior, that its effects will be singular and linear, and that its focus is individual and context independent. Or put another way, research can end up with a strange paradox. It tests what most of us don't really do in our everyday work. It tests what doesn't really happen in practice, simply because that's easier to fit into the standard research methods. And because of this, it of course ends up not researching what does naturally happen. You'll doubtless say to me at this point, well, what about research designs that both control aspects of the study and allow practice to happen as usual in natural settings? For example, pragmatic trials. Well, to a certain extent, research settings in these designs are more naturalistic, but within them, you can see the guiding theory of what should happen is still preset to a certain extent. Um, the research cart is still coming before the real world horse in these. In my response to this dilemma of ecological validity, I'm going to also remember today two researchers who we've sadly lost in the last two years, Mercedes Pavlicevic and David Aldridge. They both influenced how I think about music therapy research, and in particular about this question of ecological validity. I always felt that David could smell when the method wasn't adequate to the phenomenon. And he bravely searched in his own career for ways of research in music therapy that were ecologically valid, where research really did justice to practice. He championed careful observational studies, and he said that if we really want to know how music therapy works, often the best way is simply to ask people how they experienced it. This seemed surprisingly radical at the time. And then there was Mercedes Pavlicevich, who did her first research, her doctoral research at Edinburgh University, supervised by Colman Trevathan. This was an early experimental study in music therapy, which she proudly considered a research dead end. Her research epiphany came when she moved back to South Africa and found what music therapy meant in a non-Western context of thinking about music and health, and within the exuberant and messy ecology of African social and musical life. She often talked about being an ant researcher, following the trail of music and health on the ground. Culture and context became not confusions to the bright light of clear research for her, but rather exactly what needed to be researched in order to understand what music therapy in Africa and everywhere else actually meant. She turned from clarity to messiness very happily, from individualism to community, and from bright research lights to hanging around in the dusk of the African night. Part of the story I'm telling here is about that shift in music therapy practice and theory from the late 1990s onwards towards a reframing of practice in broader ecological ways through the community music therapy movement, through culture centered and resource oriented theory. But broader thinking in these also began to question what was ecologically valid research. I can understand if your heart is sinking at this point. Am I really still harking back to the tired old polarities of outcome and process of quantitative and qualitative, of medical and contextual models, of mixed and unmixed methods. We've not resolved, after all, these research schisms in, in the last 20 years uh, I've been witnessing them. So why continue talking about them? Actually, I'm sorry to say I am still gnawing at this bone, but I hope not just in that boring ideological way, but rather asking practically how we can address the relationship between processes and effects 
in more ecologically valid ways. Let's for a moment imagine a utopia where we can forget the politics of outcome research. Where then would a more ecologically valid music therapy research lead us? Would it prevent us going up too many more research blind alleys? Would it help shine research light on what really matters in music therapy, not just what bad fitting research methods and logic force our focus onto? I'm going to take you through a few episodes from my own journey in this route recently. I've been privileged to work in the last 15 years with the music sociologist Tia Donora on some music therapy projects. Ecological validity is one of Tia's key concerns, and I've learned from her the potential of taking this idea seriously, not just as a methodological critique, but as a practical compass for serious inquiry into music therapy practice. What happens then when you slow down research, you turn down the lights, and even intentionally blur the picture perhaps? What can you see better then? What can you hear better? What happens to your research when you lose control of it a bit, when you don't know where it's going? Often from my experience, this is exactly the point when I find things that I didn't know before, things that sometimes go against the pre-framing of theory that's guided me so far. Of course, I'm primarily talking about ethnography as method and theory here a way of giving sustained detailed attention and contemplation to social action and interaction in natural settings its key question is what's really going on here if we look and listen closely enough it puts understanding before testing or proving methodologically follows on from a rich tradition of what the poet scientist goethe called gentle methods it's more than just qualitative research ethnography confronts another achilles heel of experimental outcome research the so-called black boxing of what actually happens leaving the process between input and output unexplored and mysterious to caricature only slightly we often see the phrase music was done as the descriptor of the music therapy process that a study is trying to evaluate. But that simply won't do. If we are to generate ecologically valid research questions that can be the basis of a strong outcome study, we need to look into every corner of this black box. It needs to become rather a transparent box in all its complexity and messiness. Otherwise, we're not evaluating what's actually happening in real life. We're relying on artificial constructions of what should happen on proxy measures, which seldom match what actually happens in real life. As we've always been taught, good and useful research only comes out of good research questions. And you don't get good questions from jumping over the black box. I want to briefly mention two projects that Tia and I have had the luxury of pursuing, where Ecological validity is a key value and compass where we've been able to go slow and gentle and to look deeply inside the black box with exactly how music and music therapy seems to help in two very different social ecologies. Our findings have flown from a slow process of looking into the black box, sometimes with a dim light, asking what's really happening here in real places with real people doing real things for their own real reasons. We were trying each case to both open up and then search every corner. The first project was the Chelsea Music Therapy Project. It happened in London within a non-medical community setting for people with ongoing severe mental health problems. The Community Music Therapy Project began in a cafe and developed organically over the years. The research which was an ethnographic longitudinal case design, simply followed where the music and the people led it, letting the situation teach us exactly how music was helping there. It's a complex story, of course, and uh, you can read the details of it in the book on the slide, 
But what I want to focus on today is how becoming part of this place as researchers and by following the precise details of individual cases and their musically enabled pathways across quite long periods of time, we came to understand what outcomes meant in a more ecologically valid way. And we've called them continuous outcomes. That is, instead of looking for a simple before and after effect of musical activity, we searched our data for any ways that music seemed to be helping, physical, emotional, social, even spiritual, and coded 178 different items. These represented a continuity of outcomes rather than a simple before and after comparison. And these outcomes were often messy and mixed up. They flowed between people and spaces and times. And our baggy list included things like a smile, a turn of a melody, an unexpectedly successful performance of a song, a change in a psychological symptom, even a decision to stop drinking. Music we saw was helping before, during and after musical events, and then in increasingly looped ways, as this week's musical experience became the past, but also an encouragement towards next week's music. A musical pathway is of course, by nature, continuous and non-linear. The schema we came up with contains eight types of outcomes plotted over time, before, during, and after musical events. This thickens what we might think of an outcome in music therapy research, especially the assumption that an outcome is just a discrete point in time, rather than an ongoing process of music helping within people's ongoing lives in a variety of ways. And this project led us into thinking about care settings in relation to ecological outcomes. This time our question was, where does music therapy happen within care? If we over control the physical and social space that we research, are we missing key aspects of how music is helping? So we become interested in the everyday natural spaces of care homes and hospices, and what happens when music or music therapy enters what we've called scenes of care. So a new project we're doing now is called Care for Music, and it's developed from this interest. It's funded by the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council and involves colleagues in the UK and Norway in care homes and hospices. The title for this project intentionally flips the usual music therapy construct of music for or music in care. Rather, we're talking about care for music in these places. We think this directs attention to how it seems that music helps because of how many different kinds of people seem to be mutually caring for music. Not just music therapists, but also the residents in care homes, patients, staff, and family members. The mutual caring for music is what seems important in these settings. But from a research stance, just how do you capture, analyze, and theorize this phenomenon with ecological sensitivity? What we suspect is really important in these settings is also easy to miss, as the key evidence is seldom right in front of you. It's round and about the place. It's seldom sustained, but it consists of subtle and fleeting musical gestures between people. You sometimes only realize what's really happening when you hang around there for more than hours, for days, for months, even years. So again, our project is about the spatial and temporal aspects of ecological validity, trying to catch what exactly happens where and what exactly happens when, and exactly how musical things happen in relation to caring things. We think that previous research in this area has missed too much because its research light has been often too bright, too focused on a narrow frame and too fast moving and needing to get results based on two simple questions such as, does this work or not? 
capturing a more ecologically valid picture of caring for music may mean, of course, using some technology of capture such as 360 degree filming um, to see what's going on around and about the music. In. But it will also involve a degree of 360 degree conceptual thinking, testing out whether our usual ideas about people and music in these settings might not be multi-dimensional enough yet. I'm going to give you an example now, the kind of things that we are in, interested in exploring further that came from a pilot project in one of the care homes. A man named Angus has mid-stage dementia and he's usually part of a project um, there and in a, a music therapy group that I run in the sitting room. One day I get there and he's not in the group as usual and someone says that he's stuck in the dining room and the carers can't get him to move. So I go into the dining room and right at the end of the room there's Angus stooped over, frozen in a pose looking at the floor. I say to him softly hello and then walk over to him and he looks up, smiles, chuckles and says yes. And quickly I start singing a song we've done many times before, one that he likes as a Scotsman, Loch Lomond. As he gets involved in the music, he unfreezes and allows me to lead him down to the room and we quasi march through the dining room and into the sitting room as I improvise out of the song into a march. So we can say that the pathway for Angus between A and B is short, it's no longer than three minutes and 49 seconds. But it's also a significant pathway for him because outside of the music, this pathway hasn't been possible for him. The interesting question for us is how do these micro musical pathways work? And what's an ecolog ecologically valid method for exploring examples like this? Analysis and theory of this kind of data involves progressive peering into the black box, which here stands for everything that's happening when music is helping. But exploring the black box here isn't just a matter of digging down, but also round and about within the place and the space of the surrounding ecology of the care home. This means simultaneously working with a broad spatial focus attention and also with a narrow micro focus. It involves, that is, two kinds of research light. The first light is focused, allowing us to slowly drill down into the micro level of musical interactive detail. Here you can see we've made a very detailed index of musical events correlating with what we call paramusical events along the lines of the Nord of Robbins indexing experience. What are the things that go along with points of musical experience. So for example, in the first 12 seconds of the interaction with Angus, we see a necessary prelude to my actually singing to him and how these introductory aspects are pre-musical in an almost musical way. And then we see the sequence over seconds of my two hellos, to Angus and then he's chuckle in response and then that leads to our mutual recognition and contact through eye contact and then his yes which gives me the cue to launch quickly into the first phrase of the song. Through this micro attention to what's happening second by second we examine the fine grain of the musical and the paramusical aspects of a scene like this. The detailed relationship between the who the when, the how, and the why. And then the second type of research light is gentle and more diffused, shining around and about the scene of care, seeing how these micro events fit in with larger patterns of interaction and interaction within this particular home. As the web of events gets more complex, and more colorful, as we explore in time and then over time, how music is relating to patterns of caring. It's often said that qualitative research 
is needed as a precursor to experimental studies in order to see what's happening. But ecological validity asks us to further extend this point. The good research has to be ecologically valid throughout the research process to be really helpful for practitioners and to authentically represent practice as it really is to those experiencing it or recommending it to others. Proxy models and proxy measures shortcut the long process of genuine inquiry. They often misdirect research attention and then they miss what's really happening. At its worst, the wrong kind of experimental research puts music therapy into a black box within a white room. That's not ecologically valid and it doesn't help either practice theory development or ultimately the politics. We're not doing what we're actually doing. It's fake news. On the contrast, ecologically valid research will always look colourful. It will bring back the full, messy, sometimes confusing, exuberant colour of music's help. Mercedes Pavlicevich found this when she came back to Africa. Try to neaten up music therapy or music in Africa and you won't get very far. It's a lesson for music therapy in general, I think. Make sure you preserve the colour. For this, you'll need to make sure that the light is right and that you're travelling slowly enough to see what's actually happening down there on the ground. So I'm making a plea here for at least some music therapy research that's not bright and fast, but rather slower, dimmer, sometimes blurrier and less controlled. For this is often how we catch the true colour of complex musical scenes of care and therapy. Goethe made a critique of Newton's colour theory, saying that Newton invented a physics of light, but ended up losing colour. We have to be equally careful that we don't lose music or therapy in our quest to prove music therapy works. We need a range of research lights for a range of purposes. Let's not assume that the spotlight is always the best choice. Let's put the Achilles heel of external validity under some gentle probing light again. Let's consider what ecological validity has to say to us. Thanks for listening.
Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Michael Viega and I'm an assistant professor of music at the John Jay Cowley School of Music, Montclair State University in New Jersey. Thank you to the conference committee for the monumental task of organizing and getting us together today. Uh, it's a tremendous honor to be with you here today to talk with you about my play as an arts-based researcher. And I look forward to hearing from the other spotlight speakers and engaging in your questions afterwards. What you are hearing are autonomous research results conveyed in a song. This song, which I will discuss more about later, represents the composite theme of transfiguration in relation to understanding stages of identity formation for people who have experienced a spinal cord injury. Every sound you hear uh, contains a sample, systematically and reflexively gathered from original songs by adults who had experienced a spinal cord injury. These samples were artistically organized, coded, categorized, and structurally collaborated for you to be able to encounter them aesthetically. This song is called We're Alive, and it begins with the phrase, every door will open, followed by heralding chimes and a trumpet and a bass drum that provides firm support for affirmation of new possibilities. Transfiguration was chosen as a theme over transformation due to transfiguration's spiritual connotations. Transformation suggests that a new state of being emerges from a former self that dissipates, like a caterpillar transforming into a moth. Transfiguration, however, implies that a new state of being was always present, awaiting to emerge. Thus, a person is not remade, but rather the true nature of one's identity is revealed. 
very subtle but very vital differences such as the one between transfiguration and transformation demonstrates for me the importance of arts-based research that engagement with art and harnessing one's artistic sensibilities in research can evoke very subtle interactions that otherwise might be overlooked within other research methodologies this song is meant to provide a sonic image of transfiguration in relation to self-concepts post spinal cord injury and it encourages the listener to generate their own understanding and their own theory through the engagement with the psalm. I want to note that what I'm presenting to you today is not a definitive notion of arts-based research, as its beauty lies within its diversity. I stand within a light illuminated by Carolyn Kenny and nurtured by pioneers like Diane Austin, Jane Edwards, Tara Merrill, Alpha Woodward, Michelle Fornash, Gillian Valacourt, and Carolyn Arneson, and all, so many others who daringly brought the arts into music therapy research, especially during time periods where research silos seemed to be very prevalent in our field. Just as important to me have been researchers like Tony Wigger, Christian Gold, Felicity Baker, Sherry Robb, Katrina McFerrin, just to name a few where even though art might not have always been present in data generation and dissemination, for me, the research designs and agendas have been treated with great attention to aesthetics and beauty. These researchers are able to weave in and out of multiple ways of thinking fluidly, creating a tapestry of knowledge over a period of time and over many articles. For me, the craft of research design itself is an aesthetic stance and a creative endeavor. I do not see research and art as a binary narrative, and I do not see the role of art in research within one epistemology or one research methodology, even though it does seem that arts-based research is subjugated to an extension of qualitative design and construction of its knowledge. For me, art and research are not an either or, but a both and. When seeing arts-based research as its own research methodology that can live within both constructionist and objectionist methodologies, beautiful paradoxes and ambiguities emerge. And it's there that beauty allows for new theory to unfold, information to be felt, and to be shared in very exciting ways. The role of the arts and aesthetic knowledge in research has really flourished across a wide variety of research methodologies. For instance, statistical data is being visualized in new ways that harnesses the power of aesthetics and beauty to communicate complicated statistical data information and getting it to go viral online. Data sonification has emerged to work with biomedical and social science data of high complexity as we are able to extract patterns of listening to statistical data in ways that visualization might miss not to mention it being more accessible for partially sighted and blind communities. In recent years, there's also been a surge of artistic dissemination of research in various forms. This has allowed research to be shared outside of traditional academic contexts, whose platforms often marginalize outside voices due to gatekeeping and other systemic barriers. Research being disseminated virally online does not come without its own implical, ethical implications, such as leading and manipulating audiences through clickbait. However, the possibility of arts-based research feels more vital than ever, as humans face tremendous challenges from ecological and climate decline, poverty, global violence, vast infringements of human rights, and the spread of neoconservative ideals that leads to anti-intellectualism and a dismissal of research. I'd like to take a moment to zoom away from this very broad view of arts-based research with, towards detailing how a creative worldview has guided my own work, focusing on one particular project that was done in collaboration with Dr. Felicity Baker at the University of Melbourne. I was provided a large database of songs created by songwriters who were in active rehabilitation following a spinal cord injury. I was provided the opportunity to utilize remixing as a method of experiential song analysis to help generate new theory and enhance deductive analysis that was being done by Felicity Baker, Jeanette Tamplin, and their team. 
Remixing involves digitally sampling small moments within original songs and editing, layering, and manipulating these components to form a new composition. Remixing provides the opportunity to illuminate new knowledge by recontextualizing source sound material and representing new possibilities, generate theory, and generate new questions through aesthetic performance. For this study, I had the opportunity to experience and remix songs that I had no part in creating as a music therapist, and this provided me a level of objectivity not afforded in previous research I had done when using remix. This was beneficial as I wanted to be an outside listener without a clinical context so that I could better understand how songs created by people in music therapy can communicate lived experience to outside audiences. What I enjoy about the two articles that emerged from this work is that it details the craft of an emergent arts-based research design from pilot to implementation, investigating 27 songs written by nine different ad adult songwriters. These articles equate my artistic choices and my creative worldview to research design and data generation. For instance, my choice of digital music technology, the Akai MPC Studio, allowed me to sample small moments of each song in a much more meticulous but immediate way. I was able to analytically take notes of what I was experiencing with NMPC software. And I was able to organize and categorize the samples in a way that was very different than my creative process in Rising from the Ashes. These artistic choices were research choices. And for me, there was no need to differentiate between the two. The title of the final EP is a set of songs, a song cycle called My Curse is My Gift, which consists of four composite character portraits representing a theory of growth and self-concept post spinal cord injury. We move from non-compliance Everybody needs something from me I just want to survive Want me to get involved I will never comply Want my life the way it used to be With my mates carefree to accepting help. To creative engagement. I was here as long as I need to do an answer. 
the solution comes to me I'll wait here as long as I need Until an answer or solution comes to me I'm in my mid-twenties I owe everything to the support of my family I never thought I'd be this way But my family has given me a deep sense of hope Before my accident, I played guitar That created the energy flows through me It's with me and finally, transfiguration. This world is a gift. Showing me that there's a greater purpose to this. This world is a gift. This world is a gift. Showing me there is a greater purpose to this. Your life is worth living. Despite my injuries. This world has purpose, never give up This world has purpose, never give up I'm alive, and you're alive And we're alive The theory presented here is wholly unique and was only generated through creative engagement with these songs. The title, My Curse is My Gift, represents a complex dynamic that emerged in which songwriters suggested that their accident was a gift that actually helped them reveal their true self. The seed of this discovery came in a song, one of the first songs I actually remixed, where the songwriter was looking back at their past self and saying that she was, quote, happy in my oblivion, end quote. My artistic sensibilities drew me to the poetic nature of that lyric, and remixing it allowed me to explore it in a way that began the process of generating something new, a new complexity, something very evocative that could be explored in the future. For me, these artistic practices and research better mirror how theory and knowledge are generated as our and within our practice as music therapists. As an academic who serves on several editorial boards for music therapy journals, I've been curious as to how reviewers evaluate the artwork disseminated in research, especially when the artwork is primary in the dissemination of results. The criteria and process evaluation of performative and aesthetic results is elusive, and some might assume that qualitative criteria would suffice. However, this is contested, especially when arts-based research is presented as its own paradigm. Some question the appropriateness of evaluating arts-based research being cautious not to reduce or objectify the art in any way, whereas others might see the need to help mentor new arts-based researchers and help them navigate through academic programs. Within this debate, there is a need to understand how audiences perceive and evaluate arts-based research performative results, which has led me over the past five years to do this by performing my own study, Rising from the Ashes, for, audi for, for audiences across a, a wide spectrum uh, of places and settings and gaining their feedback and dialoguing with them. For me, engaging with audiences and performing my arts-based research study has revealed to me new elements that were missing from my original study that weren't discussed or were hidden. Data generation in arts-based research is cyclical and new information emerges within every performance. For me, that's its beauty. Arts-based research had, has its greatest impacts for me when being able to encounter audiences directly and dialogue with them about my research. Traditional academic platforms for disseminating research are often not suited for performances where video or audio links might become missing or hard to access and performative results might appear to readers as secondary to the text. For instance, the pilot design for My Curse is My Gift was published in the Nordic Journal of Music Therapy. The article itself has been viewed 525 times. However, the performative results, which came through in a song called Get and Give Back, has only been heard 138 times on SoundCloud. Many of those were not listened to all the way through, and several of them were probably me clicking on the link to make sure it worked. 
And though SoundCloud does offer a platform for feedback, no comments have been made. I compare that with my performance of Rising from the Ashes, where I've engaged 200 plus people in a variety of settings, have received over 166 evaluations, and had a chance to directly dialogue, receiving immediate feedback. In these performances, the research and knowledge is never static, but engaging, reflexive, and cyclical. Arts-based research challenges the false dichotomy that tends to separate research and art. In arts-based research, works of art can be seen as works of research, and the components of what we consider to be traditional research might not be immediately obvious until we discuss and it is seen within creative worldviews. For instance, detailing our craft as artists is an act of research design, and performing artistic inquiries is the dissemination of results. Arts-based research gets us to see research in a new light, discover new methods of inquiry, and invent new platforms of dissemination that increases audience impact. Arts-based research also embraces radical and politically motivated acts of inquiry and dissemination towards the purpose of sparking critical dialogue and promoting social justice. Powerful examples of this in music therapy include songs that V. Fansler and Mavon Gumbel have published in Critical Pedagogy in the Arts Therapies Online, Open Access Journal, exploring and expressing their own genderqueer per personhood within profession and training. Another example of critical arts-based inquiry is Dr. Hakeem Leonard's song, which explores colorism, marginalization, code switching, and tokenism as a Black person within professional settings. In these examples, making the distinction between these songs as art and research moves us into a binary, a false dichotomy that negates their impact to invite us into deeper and more meaningful conversations. The world of music therapy research is indeed fascinating, expansive, and always developing. For me, arts-based research has really helped integrate multiple parts of myself, myself as a clinician, researcher, artist, musician, educator, and a stakeholder in the human condition. Arts-based research is not its own silo, but rather it lives within a variety of worldviews and ways of being, being expressed through aesthetics and ethics. Aesthetics is not owned by one epistemology or research methodology, but can help integrate and embody knowledge in a way that I hope we continue as a field to expand upon in the years to come. And although I have spoken about arts-based research for 20 minutes, I'm not wholly convinced that that's a term that even fairly captures what I'm trying to express. Maybe that's something for me to create music about later. However, herein lies its beauty. Arts-based research is never static always expanding and always revealing new possibilities of how we design, generate, and disseminate knowledge of music therapy research. Thank you all very kindly for your time. I look forward to your questions. Have a great conference. Some interim reports and 
then talk about current issue of my project and the value of the parent perspectives in autism spectrum disorder research for young children. Okay. Autism spectrum disorder has been regarded as a lifelong complex and pervasive developmental disorder characterized with strong challenges in social communication abilities. I remember my first uh, child client with autism, four hour car Sam here. Sam was a tall and strong eight year old boy. He used to puzzle me greatly. When he approached me, he used to put his face right up to my face while pushing my chest away with his hands. I didn't quite know what he did and why he did it. So I sought supervision from ASD experts in music therapy and also child psychotherapy. They were uh, Jackie Roberts and Michelle Pundit in the UK. These were my UK days. Through working with Sam and other children who puzzled me further, I became psychodynamically oriented music therapist using improvisation as a main medium for communication. But as time went by, I began to feel psychoanalytic explanation not quite enough. And I thought just once in my life, I wanted to pursue something scientific. So I did my PhD study, which was largely quantitative research focusing on joint attention behaviors in children with autism. It was a small sample study, but the first randomized controlled trial in improvisational music therapy for preschool children with autism, comparing music therapy with toy play sessions. Given the time constraints, I will just uh, get into the I think one of the most interesting findings from my study was the social motivational aspects of musical interaction. These box plots are showing selected session analysis of target behaviors where music therapy produced joy, emotional synchronicity events between the therapist and the child that were significantly more frequent and of a longer duration than in the toy play condition, which was clearly linked to the degree of spontaneous initiation of engagement behaviors in children with autism. So uh, after my study, there were uh, two more improvisational RCT studies uh, published. And then in 2014, Christian Gold and his colleagues published updated Cochrane review in music therapy for people with autism spectrum disorder. Cochrane review is a type of meta-analysis and systematic review that they found that music therapy was effective at improving social interaction, communication, etc. based on very well designed 10 studies, but all these 10 studies were small numbers. And then uh, three years after the updated Cochrane review, the Time Aid study was published with the Journal of American Medical Association. It was the largest international multi-center early intervention trial for children with autism spectrum disorder in improvisational music therapy. It involved nine countries comparing effects of five months of improvisational music therapy with standard care using the primary measurements of the ADOS, which still is a gold standard of autism diagnostic tool. Children in the time aid study in both conditions showed slight reduction of core autism symptoms over time, but there were no significant between-group differences. 
In fact, it was negative results for music therapy. But then when I come to think of it, it showed effect of music therapy that was no less than standard care. Here, the standard care is not just one type of therapy, but everything else that children with autism received. So uh, when we come to think of it, uh, we were up against every possible interventions for children uh, with autism spectrum disorder. So uh, this next figure shows principles of uh, improvisational music therapy and it was developed by the Taiping team. Due to the time constraints, I'm not going to explain it, uh, but uh, it is very important to note because it gives guidelines to the therapist how to work with the children with autism. So the remaining question after the Cochrane updated review and the time aim study is that if not core symptom reduction, what else should we look for as improvisational music therapy specific benefits for children with autism? And what are the gaps in existing literature? And I think my current ongoing study does bridge some gaps of the previous studies. The title, the official title of a current study is Music Therapy Outcome Study for Children with Autism Spectrum Disorder Through Integration of Child Neuroimaging and Neuropsychology an exploratory study, uh, the acronym is MAIN. And it is a three-year ongoing National Research Foundation of Korea funded study. I think this study is one of the most pragmatic trial comparing a year music therapy experience plus standard care versus standard care without music therapy using biomarkers as measurements, especially child neuroimaging. So what's so special about this study? This study aims to explore correlation between social communicative behavior changes or any changes at all and neurological changes examined by neuroimaging. And in my study, there were three types of neuroimaging, anatomical MRI, resting state functional MRI, and BPI. And if I simply explain what these MRIs are, anatomical MRI measures the shape and volume and structure of the child's brain. Resting state, resting state functional MRI explores the brain's functional organization and whether it's altered in neurological disorders such as ASD. BTI measures which neurological tracks are more activated. I'm sorry if uh, my explanation is too simple or not clear because I'm not neurologist. Probably my colleagues uh, may explain it better to me, but they are not here. So uh, here is the flow diagram of the original study plan. We targeted 30 children in each group, but we ended up only uh, 15 children in music therapy condition. That's the beauty of real world research. Uh, and this uh, always happens most of the time my research. There are so many measures uh, in this study because um, it, this study is linked to the larger longitudinal study where we are to select the data uh, for control group using propensity score matching techniques. So uh, here comes the table for the demographic information and some very basic interim reports on participants in uh, music therapy condition. Well, um, children's mean age uh, when they begin music therapy uh, were four year, five months 
old, ranging from 3 to 5 years old. Children's mean IQ measured by Lighter R was 45.93. Almost every child were below uh, IQ uh, 70, except one child. I presented the ADOS pre and post communication and social interaction scores. There are some reduction in core symptoms, such as uh, you know, mean score 6 60, almost 60 to 14, 60 to 14. So two point uh, differences. Um, but the post-test results were based on only half of the children who participated. So we have to wait and see until they collected all the data. What I felt remarkable in our result was almost every non-verbal child in the beginning of this trial became Bobber after a year of therapy, except one child. All MRI results, MRI results indicated that uh, children's brains were within normal limits. And I think this result gave some parents some relief or some parents even some frustration. Now, uh, we are looking at treatment fidelity. We used improvisational music therapy treatment guidelines developed by Time and Kim. Treatment fidelity investigates how well the therapist followed the treatment guidelines. Oh, sorry. Uh, there have been four music therapists and we've video recorded every session. Randomly selected video clips were analyzed by two independent waiters. This is the result of a one waiter. Scores ranges from zero to five, and three means the principles were frequently used. However, uh, one therapist consistently scored two, meaning her, uh, you know, approach, uh, you know, these principles were sometimes used. So there were qualitative differences among the therapists. And for MRI procedures, we had to use a sedative known as POCRA. For some sensitive children, tended to spit it out immediately, or even when they swallow it, they still have difficulties in falling asleep due to their high anxiety in hospital environment. So we had many difficulties in carrying out the MRI with young children with autism, but learned better strategy in time. And then there was the COVID-19 broke out in January uh, this year in Korea. And this gave many parents good excuses to cancel the post-test appointments, including the MRI. I think as many as four times uh, the parents canceled the appointments and we had to make a new appointment or have to persuade uh, they, you know, they do the appointment later. And some parents even told our team, what good is there for my child to undergo another MRI? Isn't this only good for the researchers? And when I heard uh, these stories, I lost words. Well, what now? Uh, certain children completed the ear music therapy out of remaining 15 children by now. We had four dropouts and post tests are still going on. I had also conducted in-depth interview with 13 mothers, one father, four music therapists. Now, I would like to introduce you the first child and his mother who completed a ear music therapy with us. I'm very happy about it. And here I'm going to show you, uh, you know, the mother's home video recording. 
and which I think very valuable for us to see how musical behavior has been generalized, generalized at home and other uh, situations. His mother gave a full consent to show his home video at conferences and elsewhere. And she, let me just quote her exact words. I would like to show to the world that we are not the unfortunate family with big problems who need help and charity, but we are just the ordinary family who get on with our lazy lives and enjoy it. Besides, I have very handsome boy. So, uh, she won. Was a. Uh, oh. Yeah, I, I actually need to uh, tell about this boy. Shiwon was a number four four-year-old boy with IQ test result 47 when he entered our one-year musical trial. I asked his mother how she would describe her and her child's experience in music therapy for a year. And uh, let me just read out her exact words for you, for you only for this page. I would say, qualitative and emotional interaction began through music. Before music therapy, I used to feel I was living with the in invisible child. We, the mothers of children with ASD, tend to think that speech therapy is needed for language, play therapy for play, cognitive behavior therapy for cognition, etc. Then I had an amazing experience to witness that these were all in music therapy. In music therapy, interactive music play between Siwon and the therapist started. He became very fond of various instruments. He began naming piano, piano. Then he got to know every object has its name. Then his cognitive ability improved greatly while having such an enjoyable time. Jokingly, I begin to say to my friends, if I had to keep everything else, but keep only one, I would choose music therapy without any hesitation. Don't we all want to hear such uh, comments from the parents? I think that was really lovely. Then she talked about how music therapy facilitated social motivation through music and how his social motivations were generalized in other situations with other people, that his relationship and interaction with relatives, teachers, and other experts are changing. Now I would like to show you the home video where she once sings in front of his extended family during Chuseok that is Korean Thanksgiving Day and you will see uh, how they interact. Next video 
I'm going to show is the very touching video of him spontaneously singing happy birthday to his grandma for the first time and you will see how overjoyed his grandma, uh, grandmother was. <laughs> Patience, it's fabulous to see you all live at various times of the day around the world. Just confirming that you can all hear me. Great. Live. Okay. We're live, everyone. So thanks. There was hundreds of people uh, listening in to those five stimulating presentations. And now it's time to just touch base about some of the questions that were asked. And also, I think some of the broader questions that were raised across the presentations. And I'd love to start with that quote from Professor Gina Kim's presentation from the mother who was whose family was a participant in the study, which is, I'd like to show the world that we're not an unfortunate family with big problems who need help and charity. We're just an ordinary family who are getting on with our lives. And I think that's a really important statement to us as researchers and as music therapists. And I know that you all 
um, are strongly committed to that idea as well, that research should be somewhat empowering because we heard about using research as advocacy. We heard about using research to provide evidence. We heard about using research to discover the nuance of what is really happening for people across time. We heard all of the beautiful colours and the lights that were being shone through that presentation of mics where the music really did capture what we were saying. So there's a, there's a lot of respect across these five presentations for the profession of music therapy, but also for the people that contribute to our research, which helps us to build the profession and to understand better how to do our job uh, in more helpful ways, which is usually what we're trying to do. I noticed that Gary's dropped out, but hopefully uh, he will pop back in. So I just wondered if any of you wanted to respond uh, to the presentations overall, and then we'll go to some of the specific questions which I've been compiling in the chat. Is there anybody who'd like to say something just to begin? Okay. City. Sorry, I had to work out where the unmute button was. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, um, having uh, Gary follow straight on from, from my presentation, it kind of struck me because we both uh, were doing research in the care home, the, the aged care home environment, uh, and, and the contrast between our, our two approaches, um, it, was, it was wonderful actually to, to see it. And I kept thinking about, you know, the, um, the contribution of what Gary was, was offering for the, the large scale randomized control trial and you know delving into his he's delving into the micro level and we're delving into the macro levels of uh, you know, how is this how is this working when we try to group people together on on mass and he's going well what's individual about this person and their response and and I think we can learn from it, certainly um, RCTs can learn from that kind of research because we can embed those little um, learnings into the actual intervention that we then try to um, test across multiple people. Yes, yeah, the contrast was really extraordinary, wasn't it? And similarly, between different countries and different groups of people with whom we work. Thank you. Liz, would anybody else like to make a comment to start off? Well, yes. Um... I was really yeah. impressed by the depth and breadth uh, our presenters brought to this uh, spotlight session. It was really very impressive and I was inspired by all of you. Oh, that's beautiful, Gina. Thank you. Gary was here and he's gone again. I'm sure he's desperately trying to get back on as we speak. Um, we did have a number of questions uh, that did come in, which were quite individual. I'm noticing one question way back in the beginning from Nisamu Munga, who was asking about the blockages that can be caused by English language for people who are aspiring researchers. And I remember that, Indra, you talked about the challenges of developing critical mm. thinking skills. I think it, it popped up around that time. Um, would you like to respond to that at all, Indra? Um, sure. Thank you so much for that question. Um, one of the things that we are constantly having to tackle alongside developing research training is actually the language skills. And I think it's so important that students are also empowered to know how to use a language so that they can exercise, um, they can actually access the articles and they are able to plumb the depths. And so that's always the basis that we have to start with. And uh, if the understanding is shaky, of course, you can't expect them to be able to conceptualize and to be able to even synthesize what they are handling. Um, that is an ongoing thing, but I'm encouraged to see that uh, there are a lot of uh, genuine interests and uh, the hunger to learn more about music therapy and to try their best to master skills of language is always something that we find is existent, but um, it does mean you have to do a lot more to also focus on language skills development alongside the actual critical thinking skill development as well. 
Thank you, Indra. And I'll just keep moving through the questions because there was quite a lot of them. So we could talk about that for another hour as with everything that's come up. Welcome, Gary. We've been waiting for you and we have been talking about you in your absence as well. So let me um, bring you into the conversation. There was a question here. <laughs> oh, ecologically valid and every other kind of validity you might ask for. Uh, Sanjita Swami from the USA um, asked a question about how you were challenging our notions of music therapy research as potentially being too controlled. And then she asked, I wonder about how you see this type of community music therapy approach as connected to Indigenous ways of making music and healing and how your approach relates or doesn't to participatory action research and other forms of qualitative research that embrace a messy attitude. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I'll go into the, the details of that, that, that question, but a, a general comment would be that um, I suppose an ecological principle is as this conference is is advocating overall we have to have diversity we have to have a certain amount of natural competition yeah as soon as something a country or a profession decreases its diversity it loses something yeah because nothing can be the truth nothing can be independent of context nothing can be interest independent of politics so we're, we're all trying different things if you if you think of it as a pond we have the pond of international music therapy pond we have the world pond more diversity more good competition better thank you gary there was also a, a broad question that came through that, Mike, I know you're passionate about technology, so you might um, take this one up from Constantina Katastari, who was wondering about what all of your thoughts are on how to embed music technology in clinical practice and the possibilities and limitations and, and things to consider, uh, particularly with regards to software and preferred music. I know it's a big question. It's not exactly on topic, but I do think that technology has been a real focus of a lot of questions throughout the day. Mike, are you able to respond to that? Sure. You know, as, a, as an artist, as researcher, um, you know, technology has provided ways to really invent new platforms and new ways of engaging in research. And certainly, um, you know, creating data that is beautiful, uh, creating data that does have sonics to it, taking large data sets and, and uh, creating new ways of engaging those data sets. Um, so both within objectionist and interpretivist worldviews, certainly technology plays a big role in, in how we are able to see research, hear research, and experience research in new ways. Um, and so it's, it's really encouraging to see uh, that happening in, in all areas of research. Oh, thanks, Mike. Thank you. And um, Juan Pedro Zambonini made quite a few comments throughout the presentation, so I just want to honor that. There was one uh, larger question, maybe Gina, you want to respond to this, but perhaps anybody would be happy to. Um, he asks, what are some additional practical things that we can implement in order to use the right light and keep the colour of our research? So this is clearly responding to Gary's provocation, mm -hmm. but um, I did love how we came to that conclusion with your piece, you know, going back into the depth of the relationship and the music and and really the tradition uh, of music therapy practice. So have you got any suggestions, practical things that we can do to use the right light and keep the colour of our research shining? Mm. Mm. <laughs> wow, that's a huge uh, question. I, I have to uh, think about that before I uh, say anything. Uh, could anyone help me here? Well, you know, I really loved in your presentation how you chose to shine the light on relationship, for example, which wasn't actually yes. the focus so much anywhere else. So tell us about that decision for you. 
the importance of that in your research? Well, uh, I think with ch work with uh, children with autism, the relationship is at actually the core aspect. Uh, and I think uh, also, you know, the, the, the work we are doing is to uh, make some change uh, in their uh, human relationships with the families and friends and relatives and and you know the home video of the uh, mother um, the home video that the mother took uh, throughout this whole year actually showed a beautiful example of that and i think uh, you know what he learned in music therapy was uh, very well generalized in home situation and and the whole family and relatives and the teachers uh, got some benefits uh, of it. And, and you know, the, the whole, uh, his uh, ability to relate to other people, uh, the mother actually testified that it all started from music therapy. And I think we can all benefit from uh, simple singing and, and even just vocalizing. And that started from, you know, everything started from there. Thank you, Gina. And I just want to acknowledge there were loads of interesting questions and, and lots of positive feedback to everybody in the chat. So thank you so much. We have literally one minute left with which to make any concluding comments. And given that you're all wonderful experts, very articulate uh, in very different ways across the world, uh, is there anybody who'd just like to make a concluding comment? Maybe a metaphor from Gary or anything you like. Color. Keep the color. Yeah. Keep the color. Keep the color. I like that a lot. And there's Any a lot color. of response All to that colors. in the chat. Every color. <laughs> and watch out, watch out for external validity. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. hit you. <laughs> that is so and true. Keep the passion. Keep the passion. I seem to have turned myself on to be here. How did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> keep the passion. Keep the keep passion. The passion. Indra, yeah. any yeah. final yeah. last comment from you, Indra? I love all the presentations that were shared today. And I think one thing that is so clear is, you know, if we keep our focus on the clients mm -hmm. and the people that we want to serve, I think that is what actually helps me to stay afloat when things are hard. Sometimes when we are trying very, very uh, much to transform the community through research, there will be times when we really feel we're down in the valley, but just staying focused on the populations and why we're doing it. I think that is what ultimately fuels our passion. Thank you so much to everyone. I really was inspired. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. I hope those of you who are at night time have a nice sleep now in Australia. Yeah, We're just having to get up. Yeah, <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.